Let me share with you the starting um, proposition of tonight's talk. Um, Based starts in a word that um, I have never said to more than one people, one person at a time allowed today. Stan, Stanning Dickinson, Stan, noun, an extremely or excessively devoted fan, Stan, verb. To exhibit fandom to an extreme or excessive degree, words that entered Merriam-Webster's dictionary um, in 2009 um, out, of the, um, out of the coinage of the rap star Eminem. Um, Here's the starting proposition, then, of tonight's lecture. One of the important ways we read Emily Bronte and Emily Dickinson today is through their translation into all kinds of new media, new, new cultural artifacts, and new fan cultures. True, Emily Dickinson fans were dressing up in Dickinson, copies of Dickinson's white dress to recite her poetry well before the 20th, 21st century. In 1976, the actress Julie Harris did it on stage, starring in William Luce's play, The Bell of Amherst. In the 1990s, when I was a board member of the Society of uh, Emily Dickinson International Society, from time to time at the annual conferences, at least one annual conference that I attended, a scholar after dinner would dress up in Emily Dickinson's white dress to entertain us. I will name no names. Um, uh, the proposition of this talk tonight, though, is that there is something different about the way that Emily Dickinson, Emily Bronte, um, and other writers, to be sure, are being translated into all kinds of new media. Yes, before the 20th century, someone could dress up in the white dress and recite Dickinson's poetry. Um, in the 20th century, someone could dress up in a white dress and recite Emily Dickinson's poetry. It's not, though, until um, more recently that a fan can dress up in her own handmade copy of Dickinson's white dress, um, take a picture, apply a digital filter on it to make it look aged and 19th century, post that picture to Instagram, and then where it is picked up then by the staff of the Emily Dickinson Museum in Amherst, who then repost it to Twitter um, with a provocation to dress up like Emily when you're coming to work, where it turned up in my feed April 24th, 2023 of this year, just short, or shortly after I arrived at Cornell. As the Dickinson Museum's tweet about the fan in her white dress suggests, cultural institutions have increasingly found ways to meet stands in their own media spaces. What's true of the Emily Dickinson Museum is also true of what the Manchester Guardian, writing in 2018 um, about Emily Dick Bronte's centennial, called the strange cult of Emily Bronte. Bronte fans celebrating in 2018 could revisit what The Guardian called the heroine chic of a 2011 television adaptation of Wuthering Heights. Or they could come to Haworth itself on a pilgrimage to the Bronte's family home, and thanks to the marvels of um, civilian remote technology, um, they could follow a drone following the imagined path of Emily Dickinson's hawk, Nero, across the moors. Um, then they could take in a video installation created by a social entrepreneur and um, supermodel, um, Lisa Cole. And if that weren't enough, they could go out into the moors and visit a stone monument put there by Kate Bush, reprising her 1978 hit song, Wuthering Heights. Um, as the Manchester Guardian aptly commented, you can find any version of Emily Bronte here. Um, she's a rock, she's a bird, she's a songstress. Um, she can be anything you like wherever you are in the world. Again, thanks to these new marvels of both the physical cultural industry and digital platforms. If you happen to be in Ithaca, New York, rather than the United Kingdom this past spring, you could have gone downtown and seen Emily Bronte in the biopic, Emily, which had a short run downtown and is now streaming um, in an afterlife on Showtime. Or you could read the story of the three Bronte sisters in a graphic novel um, available in both English and Italian that was brought out by Graphic Universe, a publisher specializing in graphic fiction aimed at young and developing readers, a whole new marketplace um, for culture in, in the present age. Um, of multimedia. 
Emily Dickinson, too, uh, you won't be surprised to hear, is living many afterlives in new media. The first decade of the 21st century saw the release of two movies about Dickinson, A Quiet Passion, um, which came out in 2016, directed by Terrence Davies and starring Cynthia Nixon, yes, of Sex and the City. Um, and then there was Wild Nights with Emily in 2018, um, a romantic comedy or satiric comedy, depending on which critical handle you wanted to pick it up by, um, that was directed by Madeline Olnick, uh, based on Olnick's stage play, um, mounted off Broadway in 1999, and then it moved, among other places, to Boston, where I saw it in that year. Um, as you might gather, though, from the um, their prices, on Amazon right now. Um, neither of these two works has been anywhere near as successful in this new media afterlife as, yes, the Apple Plus TV Plus series, Dickinson, created by Elena Smith and starring Haley Steinfeld as Dickinson. Um, Dickinson, the series, ran from 2019 through 2021 three seasons, earned an overall audience rating of 92% from the site Rotten Tomatoes and the Golden Tomato Award from the rating site in its final season, and generated a lively and still ongoing parallel conversation on Twitter and other social media platforms about the show. And it goes on. In the middle of the Dickinson TV series, in December 2020, pop diva Taylor Swift announced a new item titled Evermore dropped on Emily Dickinson's birthday. Fans wasted no time connecting the dots. Considering Swift's intentional release dates, her quarantine activities, and her past literary references, some of her fans decided that Taylor references Dickinson throughout the album. Noting that Swift is good friends with Haley Steinfeld, um, who's part of Swift's entourage, um, they surmised this blog from the Kent State University English Department surmised that this album might have been part of um, Swift's way of honoring her friends project and, and her work there. Um, and they noted that um, looking at that the, um, in their view, in this fan reading, the title of Swift's album, Evermore, echoes the final line of a poem that Emily Dickinson sent to her then sister-in-law, Susan Gilbert Dickinson in 1858. I choose, out of the wide world, I choose Sue forevermore. Evermore, got it, okay. Um, you got that. Um, because Taylor's lyrics tell stories of forbidden love affairs and letters written to the fire, it's easy to imagine Dickinson, Kent State English concludes, having Taylor's indie pop album on repeat during her own sad girl autumn. And then there's more. This fan theory made its way back to Haley Steinfeld in a 2021 interview with a London-based radio station in which Steinfeld finds out that Taylor Swift's Evermore is based on her character. Okay. Surveying this landscape, um, Dickinson scholar Perraic Finnerty recently wrote that Emily Dickinson, quote, has never been more fully embedded in popular culture or more talked about beyond the confines of academia and the cultural heritage industry. Dickinson is now a canonical poet and a celebrity a publicity-mediated figure whose name is entangled in the type of global promotion that accompanies television and movie productions and their stars. Um, uh, entangled, yes, you would have to say, whose character is whose um, in this scenario of identification and desire. In any case, it seems fair to say that Emily's on fire right now. Taylor Swift sang Ivy Without Me, so now I'm going to light my Emily Dickinson poetry book on fire. Um, so my question for us tonight, um, the question I posed to Caroline, um, is how do academic literary scholars um, understand and practice our professional or disciplinary roles in this new reading? What is our job here? Is it to put out this fire or to do something else? Um, and with that question, I will turn the virtual podium over to Caroline Levine coming to us from Germany. Caroline. I 
I love this question that uh, Mary posed to me about how we professors, uh, scholars, and teachers of these beloved 19th century writers should approach them in this moment of, of a kind of media boom. And on the one hand, I think Mary and I both agree that it's fantastic um, to have this a whole slew of new readers, new questions coming to these beloved women writers, because that's part of what keeps research going and keeps research alive. Um, so, for example, readers in recent years have been asking a lot of really urgent questions about race and slavery in relation to 19th century texts in particular. Um, and Dickens when, was writing during this, the U.S. Civil War. Um, the Brontes probably read Frederick Douglass. They might even have seen him lecture. Um, and now that gives us a new lens on Wuthering Heights, where Heathcliff is an orphan found in Liverpool, which is a port city that's the hub, a hub of the global slave trade. And when he's discovered, he's speaking an unrecognizable language and, and has dark skin. He's called a gypsy throughout the novel. So this helps us to rethink the race, uh, the themes of race in Wuthering Heights. Um, and Andrea Arnold's wonderful 2011 Wuthering Heights, um, there's a scene at the, still from that here, it actually casts uh, Heathcliff as a black first boy and then man. Um, so to get us to think about the racialization that might be implicit in Wuthering Heights. So new generations, in other words, bring to life um, all kinds of questions that are really exciting for us scholars. But sometimes I think pop culture brings the past so close to us, so much into our own time that its differences from us start to fade from view. And I do think we lose something that way. So when we imagine that the past is just like us, we're basically projecting our own beliefs and values onto a really different world. And then we can't recognize its strangeness. And that narrows our own world, I think. So here's an example. When I first learned that there were two new biopics of the Emilies, I was so curious to learn how on earth filmmakers, uh, movie producers, were going to make dramatic plots out of the lives of two very isolated women who rarely went anywhere, hated to socialize, and never had sex. Well, the answer is <laughs> that both generations in our own time added sex pretty much immediately. Um, and that made me think that our own culture has trouble imagining rebellious intensity without sex. That's like the framework in which we think about rebellious intensity. And I wonder, does that limit us or does that point to our own limitations? As far as we know, neither Emily had a lover, um, but both Emily's had an incredibly intense and even sensual relationship to the natural world, including clouds, storms, and even insects. Emily Bronte explicitly preferred dogs to people. So is there something we're missing when we look for sex and maybe miss the ways in which these 19th century women writers have this intense connectedness to nature? Um, I wanted to try out a few lines from a poem by Emily Bronte. She's more famous as a novelist, but she was a poet too. Um, to think about this question about whether we need to think about her strangeness or difference from us. So here are the lines. High waving heather neath stormy blasts bending, midnight and moonlight and bright shining stars, darkness and glory rejoicingly blending, earth rising to heaven and heaven descending, man's spirit away from its drear dungeon sending, bursting the fetters and breaking the bars. So probably if you've ever felt excited by watching a storm rage around you, this image will be resonant for you. I don't think it's impossible to have, to find uh, a relationship to it ourselves. But I think if we push a little further, there's something complicated and unfamiliar about Bronte's thoughts about freedom going on here. So she says that when nature is wildness, wildest and most out of control, that's when our human spirits are free. 
So I think that challenges some of the dominant ideas in our own culture, which so often assumes that human freedom comes from dominating nature through science and technology. So Bronte might, might get us thinking along new tracks about what our relationship to nature might be. Um, and I think about this a lot in our moment of climate crisis. I think we need lots of new and different relationships to nature to help us reset our, uh, our usual stories and relations. So in general, I think we tend to think of the past um, in ordinary popular culture as either just like us or as backwards and unenlightened. But what I'd like to do is to encourage us to think instead about how the past might unsettle and challenge our own worldviews. So I want to burst three myths about the Emilies and their 19th century context that I think might surprise you. The first myth, women writers were discouraged from writing and publishing their work. Um, this is something I hear from my students every single semester. We have this assumption that 19th century women writers had a hard time getting published. We see the myth very clearly in the Apple TV series where Emily Dickinson's father explicitly prohibits his daughter from publishing her work and he wants his much less talented son to write poetry and present it publicly instead. But there's a lot more complexity about Dickinson's relationship to publication and some of her friends really strongly encouraged her to publish her work. And she was ambivalent about taking them up on their invitations. It's possible that she worried that editors would try to tame her highly original and experimental texts into more conventional poetic forms, which is in fact what happened after her death. So it's possible that she was sort of protecting, protecting her own poems um, from editors. As for the Brontes, you've probably heard that they took men's names so that they could get their novels published. It's, it's super extreme history heroes! It's the Bronte sisters, super-powered English authors from the 19th century! They're Charlotte, Emily, and Anne! All forced to fight evil publishers to get their books into print! Girls can't write books! Ha ha ha! That's why the Brontes pretend to be men with their super-disguised mustaches! We're boys. Guys, your books have revolutionized the gothic romance novel. They're awesome. But the joke's on you, narrow-minded Kirk. We are women. What? No one wants to read books by girls. Get out of here. Oh, yeah. The Fronte sisters come with boomerang, book-throwing action. Take this, you sexist pig. I wrote Jane Eyre. I wrote Wuthering Heights and Anne wrote Agnes Grey. Book on Fronte. You'll never get into this club, Bronte. Bronte sisters, power up! Together, the Bronte's wrote books about confident, independent women. Now they join forces again to become the all-powerful Bronte Soros! Bronte Soros comes with barrier-breaking feminist vision! You win! Oh! Run away! Ah! The Bronte sisters come with independence. So remember, kids, use your brain and you'll make history! All right, so um, we have this myth that um, the Brontes were no girls allowed in the literary clubhouse. They weren't allowed to get in. Um, but here's what might surprise you. Did you know that women novelists in the 19th century actually sold better than men, and some male authors took women's names for that reason? Um, every semester when I present that to my students, they're very shocked. Um, you might also have noticed, um, and Mary, if we could go to the next slide mm -hmm. after this, um, you might also have noticed that the Brontes didn't actually really take recognizably or ordinary men's names. They took deliberately ambiguous names. They called themselves Kerr, Ellis, and Acton Bell. And there was something so odd about the gender ambiguity that a lot of readers assumed they were pseudonyms and started speculating right away about whether they were men or women. So in a way, by creating these, by using these ambiguous names, the Brontes kind of deliberately created a buzz around the question of their gender. Now, lots of readers at the time suspected that the authors might be women, but they had trouble imagining that nice, respectable women could have come up with such brutal and ferocious characters so maybe the author wasn't a respectable woman. 
one American reviewer figured that there was such a mix of masculine and feminine traits in their novels that the novels must have been written by two brothers and a sister. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My favorite review comes from the philosopher G.H. Lewis, who, after the Bronte's identity was revealed, wrote this. <laughs> Curious enough it is to read Wuthering Heights and the Tenant of Wildfell Hall and remember that the writers were two retiring, solitary, consumptive girls. Books <laughs> coarse even for men, coarse in language and coarse in conception, the coarseness apparently of violent and uncultivated men turned out to be the productions of two girls living almost alone, <laughs> filling their loneliness with quiet studies and writing their books from a sense of duty hating the pictures they drew, yet drawing them with austere conscientiousness. Um, so for Lewis, the only way to imagine that respectable young women could have written these books, uh, incredibly violent and coarse, as he calls them, was for them to have hated writing them. Um, so to come back to our ideas about women writers, it was not, in fact, hard for women to publish literary texts in the 19th century. But it was hard for women to publish these startlingly powerful and experimental texts. And I think it might actually have been hard for men to publish them too. Um, <laughs> yes, and being ahead of their time was, was the problem and not specifically their gender. The second myth that I wanted to talk to you about um, is the idea that women who refused marriage were brave rebels. So both biopics, Imagine Our Emilies, as rebels against convention. And in the Apple TV version, Emily Dickinson emerges as a defiant queer woman who rejects men's marriage proposals on principle. But there are a couple of misconceptions at work here. First of all, when we talk about how Victorian women were supposed to get married and look after their homes, we're actually talking about a very narrow sliver of the social world. Working class women have always worked. And in the 19th century in Britain, women were often factory workers. Meanwhile, in the US, enslaved women were usually explicitly prohibited from marrying and often raped by slaveholders. So we're talking about just a small sliver of the population that was supposed to be this kind of domestic ideal. But secondly, marriage was often an economic necessity for middle class women. So there weren't a lot of options for middle class women to work outside the home. You could be a governess, but there wasn't there weren't that many governess jobs, more in the novel, in fact, than in the world. Uh, be a companion to a wealthy woman. Um, you could be a novelist, but again, that was hard to break into. So most women had to rely either on fathers or husbands for their survival. Both Patrick Bronte and Edward Dickinson were pretty stern men, so it's not clear that their daughters had more freedom or autonomy by refusing marriage than they did by staying at home. They were still very much subject to masculine authority. So maybe the Emilies refused marriage for some other reason, um, and since the their identities were first disclosed, readers have wondered, were they secretly heartbroken? Maybe they dedicated their lives to a love that wasn't returned, or maybe they were queer, filled with sexual desires they weren't allowed to pursue. The possibility of their queerness is particularly hard to know for sure, because it was perfectly acceptable for Victorian women to sleep in the same bed, express devotion to each other, and even, quote unquote, practice for marriage through intimate female friendship. So probably what we'd call sex between women happened a lot, but it might not have registered as sex to them. <laughs> And they wouldn't have had a sense of a sexual identity. That belongs to our time, not theirs. So might they have been queer in our sense? Absolutely, yes. But that in itself wouldn't have made them rebels, exactly. Mm -hmm. I think the most disconcerting rebels at the time were the women who actually asserted their economic autonomy by setting up households together. Um, so as long as women were doing their thing in the privacy of their own beds. I don't think anybody cared. That didn't disturb the economic system. Um, what disturbed the economic system was women actually living together uh, in their own households. The third myth is 
Uh, and this is one that I was really, I saw so vividly in both biopics, is the idea that women constantly policed each other's behavior. And I actually think that we've gotten this partly from Austin adaptations, where women do police each other's behavior. And the kind of boom in Jane Austen movies has made us think that this was true of the 19th century. Um, and so these two adaptations show sisters and also mothers really intent on trying to get the Emilys to dress and behave in ways that are normal. So in the film, Emily, Charlotte is terrified that her weird and reclusive sister will embarrass her. And on TV, everyone around Emily Dickinson is trying to push her to be less peculiar. They, the producers even came up with a group of mean girls to foreground Emily's weirdness. But this is really very much about our time and not about theirs. Charlotte Bronte was the one who really encouraged her sister, Emily, to publish her work. She was also filled with anxiety when Emily's health started to fail um, while they were away from home working as teachers. Charlotte wrote, My sister Emily loved the moors. Flowers brighter than the rose bloomed in the blackest of the heath for her. Out of a sullen hollow and a livid hillside, her mind could make an Eden. She found in the bleak solitude many and dear delights, and not the least and best love was liberty. Liberty was the breath of Emily's nostrils. Without it, she perished. Every morning when she woke up elsewhere, the vision of home and the moors rushed on her and darkened and saddened the day that lay before her. Nobody knew what ailed her but me. I knew only too well. In this struggle, her health was quickly broken. Her white face, attenuated form, and failing strength threatened rapid decline. I felt in my heart that she would die if she did not go home. Charlotte actually sacrificed a lot to make sure that Emily could stay at home, including working some pretty terrible jobs to cover their household costs so that Emily wouldn't have to teach also. Similarly, Emily Dickinson's sister, Lavinia, took care of her and the whole household so that her brilliant sister could write and think. Dickinson wrote, Vinnie has been all so long. I feel the oddest fright at parting with her for an hour, lest a storm arise and I go unsheltered. So to me, it seems really striking and troubling that our culture, our own time, insists that these sisters were filled with resentment envy and petty disapproval. Why can't we imagine women willing to make sacrifices for each other's happiness and proud of each other's talents? I sometimes shock my students when I say that in some ways the 19th century was more progressive on gender relations than we are. And here's one of those places. I think the Emilys and their sisters and friends in their own real lives have something to teach us now about women's friendships and women's solidarity. So now I want to turn it back to you, Mary, to think about why these adaptations might also be good for us. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Caroline. And we'll be back to you soon. Um, I don't know whether you knew, Caroline, in putting that together or whether folks in the audience know, um, but um, it's possible that Emily Dickinson, like Emily Bronte, also preferred dogs to people. Um, her father gave her a Newfoundland pup in 1849, and she promptly named him after the dog in a favorite novel of 1849, um, Jane Eyre, um, Carlo after the dog in Jane Eyre. Um, she became the companion of her walks in nature. Her father felt safer with her going out with this, um, became a very large dog. Um, um, she was heartbroken when he died. Um, and although a big dog, probably Carlo, makes a cameo appearance in the very final episode of season three, um, season three, episode 10 of the Dickinson Society, I think they really missed an opportunity to put, to cast a charismatic dog all the way through the TV show. Um, I'd like to thank Carolyn as well for naming so many of the things that are so noxious to me in these in these recent adaptations. You have these envious, repressive mothers, sisters, and other women in relation to the heroines. You have the inability of either production to imagine rebellious intensity without sex, in Carolyn's words. Yes, the writers of Dickinson and Emily have both absorbed a lot of important scholarship about race, class, and gender in the 19th century. Minor characters in the Apple TV Dickinson series now and then get to lecture the young Emily Dickinson about her privilege with a sideways wink at those of us in the show's present day audience who might ourselves be inclined to worry about this. 
But what the series shows us over and over again are rich, attractive young people using literature as a reason to dress up in costume and then undress for a hot reenactment of the Scarlet Letter, one where we get to see, not just imagine, Hester and Dimsdale's lovemaking. For me, at least, this seems profoundly untrue about Emily Dickinson's own relationship to her own embodiment, as well as, I dare say, um, profoundly unqueer. <laughs> that said, I'll give the Dickinson series props for busting one old myth about Dickinson's poetry. Um, Caroline alluded to this, that her work had absolutely no relation to current events in her own time, that she paid no attention to the Civil War and cared nothing for politics, even as her father earned his seat in Congress. Um, the Dickinson show so, shows her deeply engaged. However, um, I, I think from my perspective, there's a fair amount that they get wrong. The Dickinson series, seem to want to make Emily Dickinson into a kind of invisible national heroine of the Civil War, wanting to adapt her poetry to a new mission of uniting the, met, the, the nation, make healing people's wounds, staunching, um, staunching the blood in some way. They want to pair her in this way as a kind of domestic um, counterpart to Walt Whitman, a pairing that you'll see over and over again, of course, in subsequent literary history. Um, they want her to make her a, a national heroine of the Civil War, or they at least want her to have wanted that for her poetry. And the trouble is, um, she wasn't that heroine, and apparently she didn't want it for her poetry. Um, she did worry about her distanced, vicarious relationship to the war, as, as in this poem. Um, and she made it a subject for eloquent poetry, um, made it a subject for poetry along with many other subjects that continued to occupy her through the war years. She never became an author of what you would have called in the 19th century national lyrics um, or unifying patriotic, patriotic poems. I would suggest that from the perspective of this poem, um, unity might be another name for dissolution, the dissolution of an individual's identity in battle's horrid bowl. Um, and that was not something that appealed to her, I think, greatly. When Dickinson began writing to Thomas Wentworth Higginson in 1862, Higginson on the right here, she wasn't um, asking him about his views on slavery, and those were radical, as the show tells us. He bankrolled, helped bankroll John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry and was almost arrested for it and sent to prison. Nor was she asking him about his experience leading a black regiment in the Civil War. Um, which the series, the series makes up for that gap by interpolating little scenes that are essentially taken out of the film Glory, for those of you who remember that. She never indicated interest in these of Dickinson, Higginson's many causes. She addressed him instead as an editor and contributor to the Atlantic Monthly with the biggest question on her mind. Are you too deeply occupied to say if my verse is alive? As far as we know, she never sent it feels a shame to be alive to Higginson or to anyone else. Whatever else Higginson credited her, writing, credited her writing with, it was not, as the finale to the Dickinson series would have it, capturing his experience or the national experience of the Civil War. Which leads me to another point that I think the Dickinson series gets at least partly right and partly wrong, um, which is Dickinson's interest in getting her own poetry published. I do think, as Carolyn has said, that she was ambivalent about it, and the series acknowledges that. But she did send poems, um, or she showed poems, to many editors. Um, Samuel Bowles, as in the series, both with and without the mediation of Susan Gilbert Dickinson, Thomas Wentworth Higginson, an outreach that she made completely on her own without any pushing from um, Susan Gilbert Dickinson. Indeed, in the, the series, um, they think Susan Dickinson was jealous of her outreach there. And then much later than the series goes, in the early 1880s, as her own life was about to end, Thomas Niles, an editor in Boston. Um, other women played a big role, as Carolyn notes, in pushing Dickinson to publish. Susan Gilbert Dickinson in the years treated by the series and then later on, Helen Hunt Jackson, who also knew Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who then made the introduction of Dick for Dickinson um, to Thomas Niles. 
did she want to publish? Well, I guess if I saw someone writing to editors over the course of her life, I would think she, you know, maybe she was quite interested in that. Um, Dickinson first sent Niles, as far as we know, the, can reconstruct the order of the correspondence. She first sent Niles a poem denying that she had any interest in publication. How happy is the little stone that rambles in the road alone and doesn't care about careers? I don't want to publish. Um, but... But then she sent him several mo more poems in at least two batches. Um, some of them were fresh copies of poems she had first written down, to the best of our knowledge, two decades before, during the Civil War. Um, it seems to me that she was combing through her entire repertory. She was combing through her archive of poems and trying to catch his taste. If he didn't like this, he wrote back to her about it, she'll try him on that. Um, one of these poems um, that she sent to him was about George Eliot, um, the writer George Eliot. Her losses make our gains ashamed. Dickinson wanted from Niles, among other things, intelligence about any forthcoming George Eliot biographies. She also sent Niles um, her own, her very own copy of first edition, first American edition of the poems of Currer, Ellis, and Acton Bell, as in... Charlotte, Emily, and Anne Bronte, aware of its value as a nice copy of a very rare book, Niles sent the Bronte poems right back, asking Dickinson to send more of her own poems instead. It came, though, to nothing. Niles gave her a polite brush off. It seems to me, though, that Dickinson was interested and remained interested ups and downs throughout her life in the possibility of being published and being read in the company of women writers whom she respected. Which leads me to a final observation about what the Dickinson series maybe got right, at least um, as a thought experiment worth taking seriously. This series is partly, the series, the Dickinson series, is partly about celebrity culture, media culture, and fan culture in the 19th century. It wants us to believe that we didn't make this stuff up, that and that it was part of how Dickinson and her family read, not just the way that we read Dickinson and Bronte today. In the series, when a new volume of Dickinson's Bleak House arrives in the Dickinson household, the Dickinsons leap on it. We're main mainlining that stuff, censoring the language a bit. We're mainlining that stuff, says Austin. And Lavinia sighs, I'm such an Esther the protagonist of, of Bleak House. Um, they're Dickon stands. Um, did the real Emily Bronte stan the Brontes? You could make a case. You know, I've laid the Easter eggs through this, through this presentation. Her dog's name, her copy of their poems. She also wrote this challenge to Elbridge Bowden, who was a partner in her father's law firm and an Amherst College graduate, um, when she returned to him his copy of Jane Eyre. And this was before, um, it's around 1849, so it's before it's widely known that Charlotte Bronte is um, Currer Bell, but while these, this avid speculation that Caroline has talked about is alive there. Um, Mr. Bowden, if all these leaves were altars and on every one a prayer that Currer Bell might be saved and you were God, would you answer it? Um, seems like a kind of question a Stan might ask. Um, and now I have a couple of questions for Caroline. And I'm speaking to her, I'm posing these questions um, to her as a scholar of, among other things, realist fiction, 19th century fiction, coming from me as a scholar of poetry. Um, I think we all know or tacitly know, um, whether we're professional literary scholars or not, that um, in relation to realist fiction, fandom stereotypically expresses itself as over-identification with a protagonist. I am Esther of Bleak House, or I am Jane Eyre, the Jane Eyre whose autobiography has supposedly been edited by Currer Bell. Um, but my question for, for the scholars of fiction in this room um, is, what counts as over-identification? Um, where's the line between reading like a stan and reading like the reader solicited by the genre itself. Ooh, now let me poke. Oh, can I post it about poetry first before we turn it over? Okay, because um, then I'll explain Helen Mirren what she's doing there. Um, 
I'll pose this for reading poetry. Um, how does identification work in reading poetry? Where's the line between reading poetry like a stand and reading poetry like the reader solicited by the genre itself? Um, Jonathan Culler, Cornell's great scholar of poetry, proposes that lyrics are written for readers to repeat. The poem, Culler says, quoting and paraphrasing Jacques Derrida, addresses you saying, learn me by heart, copy out and watch over and preserve me. <laughs> a poem according to Culler and Derrida is both that which asks to be learned by heart and that which learns or teaches us the heart, which invents the heart. You become the poem you repeat and learn by heart. Um, this kind of identification doesn't require costume drama. Check out this YouTube video in which Helen Mirren recites Dickinson's Wild Nights. And that's all. Just her voice over this still photograph. That's all. No white dress, no corsets, no on-camera sex. Um, you can try this kind of identification at home, and I strongly recommend it. That's for me. Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's, oh, a that's a wonderful. Uh, and now it's all us. Um, we're going to, we'll talk. We'll bat this back and forth, and then open it to questions. Yeah. So um, one thing that I often think about in the 19th century is it's really a, a historical moment when the ordinary person becomes interesting for the first time. So if you think about literature you know, in the long history up until, you know, the late 18th century, let's say, mm -hmm. it's mostly about princes and gods and kings. It's not about ordinary people. Um, in the 19th century, we get really interested in ordinary people. And I think it's part of that slippage between, you know, we're suddenly reading about people who could be like us, sort of for the first time. Um, and we're also thinking, who are these writers who might be like us? And so I think that's part of what literature does in the 19th century is it opens up these questions about what is an ordinary life and what is, what is meaning? What, what should the shape of my life look like? Um, and um, in the past, you might have um, I'm generalizing, of course, wildly, but you might have looked to the Bible or you might have asked your priest. <laughs> um, but you probably wouldn't have had literature as your answer to, you know, if you were an ordinary day-to-day uh, -day person, you wouldn't have looked to literature until the 19th century for answers about that. So I think identification really develops very intensely in this period. Um, mm -hmm. I always thought it's fascinating the way that Emily Dickinson, uh, actually both Bronte and Dickinson are fairly, um, because the works are so complex and so experimental, they're some of the least identification, you know, in some ways it is really about the, this kind of complicated words on the page and not about uh, actual people you could imagine being or being like, um, and yet readers have been drawn to them really intensely. Um, and so I've often wondered about sort of the, why does the experimental text lend itself to that? Um, I don't know if you have thoughts about that. Hmm. I don't know that I do. I, I will say that I found myself drawn over and over again to the moments in the Dickinson series where Dickinson's own, her poetry, um, usually the less experimental end of her poetry, um, but her, po her words are taken up by someone else um, and spoken by her father when the very first one comes out. Um, so hearing those words as, as a contemporary reader, um, not Dickinson herself might have done that, you know, standing in that place. Um, but those, those, those acts of identification seem to me different from identifying with a character in a novel but it's also this show turns her into a different kind of object of identification. Um, the show ends with her putting on the white dress um, that we can then copy in the future. Um, but I will say, I mean, part of I go back to my question about what are we doing as literary critics in relation to this stuff, um, and to, to this this fandom. Um, I will say that acknowledging one's early identification with this poetry. Um, 
it, it, it drives, you know, it drives the vocation. It drives the professional vocation. And I had a little bit of the shiver of that identification, um, not being Helen Mirren, but um, going to uh, the fall, this past fall, and opening an event at the Emily Dickinson Museum in Amherst where that involved, as people sometimes do with James Joyce, a 24-hour round-the-clock reading of all of Emily Dickinson's known poems. And so I was coming in in the rather late part of that, up in the um, 1400s, out of the almost 1800. Um, so for an hour, I, I didn't have the whole hour. There were 12 of us in a, um, a circle, and you just go around passing the mic. You Okay, you, you asked me how that feels, because um, I'm seeing some, well, um, I will say that it's, Dickinson being experimental, um, it's challenging her, to read her words from the page if you have not rehearsed the syntax and other things. And, and as the circle got to go around, you could see that you were three poems away maybe from being on call. And of course, there was an internet audience that was going to watch this too. And you're thinking, oh my word, do I know what this poem says? Am I going to get its syntax right? So that was one experience. And then you could also see people... Um, starting to say, am I going to get that hot poem? <laughs> you know, or I'm, am I going to get sort of this sort of more obscure and difficult one? Um, but there was a moment when I could, I could see coming, you know, about four readers away, um, a poem that I always think of as associated with Susan Gilbert Dickinson, although the manuscript early years of Dickinson's life, the years covered by this series. Um, its manuscript is destroyed. Um, so we pro probably did diminish the relationship with Susan Gilbert Dickinson by posthumous editors. Um, manuscript is destroyed. It can't be dated. Um, but it's a poem, the second quatrain of which shivers me, and I was able to look. It was one of these things I could look up from the book and recite. Um, Given to me without the suit, riches and name and realm, who was she to withhold from me penury and home? And now I'll stop talking about my identifications, but I'm just, you know, sort of what do you recite? And if you were thinking about reciting Emily Dickinson in something like that. Well, here's, a, here's, a poll. here's a poll. How many of you have seen either one of these adaptations or one of the previous Dickinson films? That's pretty healthy. Okay. Anyone have any opinions on those that they would like to mention in terms of like what they believe the... Yes, sir. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so this is a question. The When you were both talking, I suddenly remembered a series that I used to read at the Children's Library when I was a kid. Uh, which was called The Little Maid Of. And it's, it's pretty, I mean, it was already old when I was reading it. These were, I think, from the, the 30s or 40s, but the library had the complete run. And it went through all the 50, all, all the states. Uh, so there was the, with old in front of them. So there was The Little Maid of Old Connecticut, and there was The Little Maid of Old Massachusetts and Old New York, etc. And The Little Maid always wound up she was like the daughter of a farmer whatever it was um she always wound up somehow participating in a major historical moment or crisis so she found herself riding like behind paul revere or whatever it was and then like that was over she went back to being a little maid and the um so i guess my question is something about and it has to do with Caroline's, with the sort of dialectic between glamour and ordinariness. It's something about this impulse on the one hand to say like, hey, these are ordinary people like us, or we can be like them because we kind of think we're ordinary. So for them to, us to be like them, they'd sort of have to be ordinary too. But of course, secretly, like we think we're really glamorous or we would like to be, or, we imagine ourselves inserted into these moments in history. So I just was wondering uh, sort of where or if or how you see that in, in these two standing traditions. 
Caroline, you want that? <laughs> I just love that question so much. Um, there's so many things to say in response to it, but I think you're absolutely right to point to the to the problem of identification, which, like in a novel like Jane Eyre, Jane is absolutely ordinary in certain ways, but that's part of what gives her her specialness, right? It's like if you could recognize the ways in which each of us is really uh, exceptional inside, then you really have an idea of the modern individual. We're all ordinary, but we're all exceptional. <laughs> um, but I also like the idea of the sort of historical, large historical events that we could all be kind of slotted into them, that that's part of our, uh, part of a fantasy of, of being, um, of being on the spot historically. Um, I wonder if, uh, there, this is just a, a question back, but I, I wonder whether there isn't something about two very introverted women that isn't particularly mysterious and absorbing for a lot of us who grew up as readers. You know, like I was a kid who always had my nose in a book um, and the idea that there might be a way to be an exceptional person without being you know, super sociable or um, or the bell of the ball or any of those kinds of things was, I think, very appealing to me. The idea that uh, somebody could spend their lives just reading and writing and be and from that be a, an important person and make a mark on the world. So I don't know if that's also part of the story of identification for um, for a lot of us who are big readers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Next question. Uh, thank you both. Um, it's coming from a person who first heard Stan in the Eminem song. Okay. <laughs> so relating to digital media and this concept of rebelliousness that you both talked about being misplaced onto uh, sexual promiscuity. Mm -hmm. That's not actually how their rebelliousness was portrayed or taken. Mm -hmm. And today in digital media, I think rebelliousness is often looked at as piety. In a world in which promiscuity is omnipresent, that is standard, now we have a stand culture around pipe. And I don't know if I have, um, there's like an uptake of Catholicism or a new religiosity, even if on its face, it's very surface level. I see you nodding and I'm thankful um, wow. that you kind of understand the digital landscape of today's time. But maybe not full question, but how do we read this misplacement of stand culture? misplacement or misallocation of what rebelliousness looks like in relation to an erotic or sexual landscape. And I feel like they're very antithetical from the 19th century to today, doing opposite um, showings. So, think through that. Well, Caroline, was it your hope that, um, I mean, you observed that we don't seem, or the we of the moment we were talking about um, 15 minutes ago don't seem, or the folks making these adaptations don't seem to have, seem to have only one vocabulary for rebellion, and that's to, you know, do that. Um, and so now you're saying there's, do we want a seesaw of these things, or do we want multiple vocabularies? I, I, I take it, Caroline, that you were issuing a call for, let's have more vocabularies for what rebelliousness might look like, or in at one time, but if if one goes viral, you know, does it crowd out all the others? Or, and I don't know this this part of um, stand culture at the moment at all. <laughs> it does make me think also about the fact that one thing that's missing from the uh, mm -hmm. two biopics that we talked about in most detail is their religious. Uh, intensity and heterodoxy. I mean, both of them are are refusing sort of ordinary um, formulas of religious belief, but that's not because they're not religious at all. Um, and so piety is a really interesting question. Does piety mean kind of forcing people into a certain kind of moral... Um, straight jacket or does it mean a kind of intensity of religious belief and those are i think very we could think of those very differently in relation to the two emily so i i don't know i feel like um my knowledge of 
Dickinson's religion is very limited. So maybe Mary, you could take up that piece of the puzzle. Well, the, it, it, there is a set piece that the um, multiple versions of these Dickinson biopics do. And the set piece is that um, however old or young the actress playing Dickinson is, they envision, they take her back to Mount Holyoke Female Seminary, which she attended for one year, and she's in the chapel with the revival happening, and she's not standing up. And all the other young women around her, um, it's a social contagion, you know, at the time, they're all standing up. Um, Mary Lyons, leader of the seminar, is getting people to stand up. They view a corpse. Won't you stand up now, Emily? And Dickinson never stands up. Um, and she's she relates this story years later, but it's dramatized, it's acted out um, in flesh, in, in a flashback. Um, and there, this particular Dickinson adaptation and the others, I think, stop. Um, and, you know, I think Dickinson was ambivalent or ambiguous about religious faith in many and eloquent ways. Um, I think she despised conventional religion. She took her dog Carlo out to the hills and rewrote famous psalms, came back and rewrote famous psalms in her own vocabulary. Um, she reused Eucharistic um, vocabularies um, to her own purposes. Um, if you don't mind reciting one more, a few more lines from memory. A word made flesh is seldom and tremblingly partook nor then perhaps reported. But have I not mistook, each one of us has tasted with ecstasies of stealth the very food debated to our specific strength. A private Eucharist of reading. So she had all this wonderful religious vocabulary at her disposal and turned it to purposes of her own. Um, it was an incredible resource. Mm. Thank you so Great. much. Yeah, that, that's a, it's a, it, to me, it suggests that rebellious intensity could be in a religious context, which I don't know if it's quite the same as what the um, audience member was talking about as piety, but that, that there might be more similarities than not in between the 19th century and now in that regard. We have time for one more question, and if anyone would like to ask something, otherwise I will turn it back over to Mary. Have anything or any observations or questions or statements? <laughs> yeah. well, I have a um, something to conjure with, um, conjure you to do as you, as you leave here tonight. I passed this bulletin board, which lives outside of Cornell's uh, comparative conflict department, comparative literature department in Goldwyn Smith Hall, um, and it's evolved since then, since I arrived in January. Um, if you look at the, the, the conflict department, um, just ask a question, what are you reading? And let people put things down there. Um, the answers are, of course, amazing. Um, Beowulf, KJ Charles, your browser history. But if you, if you, if we were to zoom in here underneath the little pen that holds the, uh, the clip that holds the marker that holds some, um, stickies for you to intervene in, you'll see Wuthering Heights. So someone out there is reading Wuthering Heights. Um, and if I think about what the job of literary scholars is to do, or the Department of Comparative Literature or another, look at all the surroundings on this bulletin board of the events, the courses, everything else that the Department of Comparative Literature is doing to surround this fundamental question. What are you reading? Tell me what you're reading. Um, and my hope or my errand to you would be go out to Goldwyn Smith Hall if you have a chance um, tonight or tomorrow, um, the weather's good, and put your own sticky up there. Um, you'll be doing us the biggest single favor you can, um, us as literary scholars, telling us what you're reading and how you're reading it. Um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you. Wait, thank you so much. And it is 2.30 in the morning, your time. I am so sorry, and I hope you're going off to the best of best of evenings <laughs> or early mornings. <laughs> lovely way to spend the middle of the night. I am so uh, delighted to have thought about the Emilys with all of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. See you again on these shores. Yes.